Hi guys, this is Ishai Bresla. We're with the CRE Shark Eye Show. And today really is exciting. Uh, we're going to talk about so many things today. And we have a very special guest, Elliot Horowitz. You can see him already if you are uh, on the video format. If you're on the, on the audio, you're going you're gonna to enjoy listening to him. Uh, we're going to have a very, very interesting conversation today. And I'm telling you that because uh, Elliot is involved in a bunch of things. But um, before that, first of all, Elliot, thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Hey, thank you for having me. Really appreciate coming on. Hundred percent. Tell me, you know what? Let's start. Let's start from the very beginning. <clears throat> let's start. Uh, real estate business. I I always enjoy, by the way, listening to you and hearing you when you come up. You always have not only a good twist of real estate, but good sense of humor, and uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, and uh, personally, that's uh, you know, I relate to that. I love uh, people who make make life funner. And that's right. what I like to do always, uh, no matter if I sit in the boardroom and, uh, and everything is very, how do you say, serious, as we call it. We always try to find a twist to bring the fun in life. So uh, tell us a little bit about you, what you run. Let's, you know, let's start from the end and then we'll go to the beginning. What okay. type of a company do you have today? And then we'll start how you get started. Go ahead. Okay. So today, and again, thank you for having me on. And about a sense of humor, I, I, I kind of find you need a sense of humor to get along in life, right? Because uh, particularly if you take yourself too seriously, it must be a hard week ahead, right? But uh, the, the, the humor kind of deflects all the other stuff that you don't want to deal with potentially. But it's good to have a sense of humor, right? And my mother, rest in peace, would say, if you lose your sense of humor, you've lost, right? So you have to... You know, keep a positive attitude, sense of humor, and whatnot, right? But as far as the business, you know, the company's H Equities. We um, we have a group of friends and family investors. Uh, we invest both debt and equity. On the equity side, we've invested mostly in multifamily properties, uh, East Coast, uh, New York, New Jersey, Florida, Atlanta. A um, couple of development deals, not too many. We're actually right now buying some medical office properties with an experienced operator, which I'm pretty excited about, uh, so which is a new, you know, a new foray into a new asset class. I'm, I'm very excited about it, actually. Um, that's the equity side, right? And those are designed to sort of hold things for a long term, 10 years or more, for the most part. And, um, you know, so far, so good, nice conservative, right? Uh, and on the, on the debt side, we um, provide senior meds and preferred equity. We've lent on everything from pieces of land, luxury condos, non-luxury condos, luxury homes, non-luxury homes, industrial. We've, we've financed defaulted loan pools. We've done note-on-note -note financing. Uh, we've done MES loans on condo construction. So we've done all of those either as direct lender or as a participant lender with other lenders we've become friendly and close to over time. Um, and those loans have mostly been in New York, but we diversified out and we did a whole pool of loans down south back in, in November on a default, large defaulted note pool. We financed that pool actually, and we put some equity in on, on, the, uh, on the acquisition side for the defaulted loans. And we did a MES loan in California where we partnered up with another uh, lender who came to us and I said, well, great opportunity, thank you. And we did it with them, right? So we're sort of expanding out. Um, things were very, very, very focused in New York up until a couple of years ago, but we slowly expanded out very selectively and opportunistically to do things in other states. So first of all, it sounds like we have a lot to talk about. And let's start with that. And uh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. Um, let's, let's do this. Let's go back a little bit, all the way back. Um, um, guys don't have a prompt to reveal their age usually. Um, I was born in 1966. I'll be 55 next week. There you go. And, and, you, you, look, and, and you look good. You look very young. Um, so I can tell you, first of all, you know, tell us about your journey, how everything started. How do you get into this real estate scene? So I was born now. So I, I, my career started off as a stockbroker a long time ago. I forget exactly when, but probably 1990, whatever. Right. And I was a stockbroker and trader for a very long time up until into the early two thousands. Right. And then the business changed so dramatically that I kind of lost my way a little bit. And I didn't want to lose all the money we made, right? Because we did well, it was a good business, we did okay. I recognized things changed. I had to take more risk to make less money. And I just, at the time, felt I needed a switch, right? I needed a switch. And I kind of 
didn't have an idea what to do, but I thought real estate might be a good switch because I knew a lot of people in the real estate business and they're all smart people and they all seem to have their acts together and they all seemed a lot less stressed out than I was at the time because as a stock trader, you know, I was at my desk, you know, eight it's in the morning. It's a slower business. It's a slower business. I, I, I didn't go to the bathroom sometimes. I didn't have lunch every day, you know, it was oh, crazy. Yes. we were throwing phones everywhere, breaking computers, it was crazy, right? So. I said, you know what, let me figure out if there's a way for me to sort of, you know, morph into the stock, into, into, the, uh, into the real estate business, right? So I kind of tried to broker deals, not knowing what I was doing, just knowing that I knew like the right people to go to, right? And, and it kind of worked, but it didn't really work because I really wasn't focused on it because I didn't know enough. So then I realized I kind of take a step back, you know, and then I, guess I got hired by somebody to work for them, then a bank hired me. But I kind of recognized that I to, to work on real estate for them or, or to originate real estate for them, real estate loans. So I kind of realized I could take my my Rolodex of people that I knew, like I knew guys doing deals. I knew guys who had money. I kind of knew I didn't want to be an operator. So I said, you know what? I like the real estate business. Let me put deals to you. Now that I know enough, because right? it took me a couple of years to get it and understand it and learn it and do it. And it took a long time, and a lot of trial and error on my own without, you know, without getting paid, just trying to figure out how to put deals together. And I realized that I do know a lot of people. So I should just figure out a way to not necessarily be the operator, but be the investor. Right. So I said, you know what? I've got a good skills as an investor. I think I know how to take risks because I took a lot of risk as a trader, as a stock trader and stock broker uh, for a lot of you know smart people. Not me. They, they, the, the investors were smart. I wasn't smart. Right. So I started figuring out a way to, you know, a friend of mine's buying a building. Hey, you need some equity. I know investors. Let me see a deal. So I started out with buying property as an investor group. <laughs> talking to friends or family who you know, knew me, liked me, hopefully trusted me as well, right? And took the money and invested in a few deals with a few different people who were operators, right? And I said, wow, this is an interesting model. But some of these deals would take- And, and that years. was on the equity side, right? That's equity. the guy, I'm sorry, yes, that's the equity yeah. side. That's the equity side. Then I'm realizing, wow, some of these deals take a year, they take two years to, to, to get their money out, three years sometimes. Investors also want returns on a daily basis. So I got to figure out a way to get back into the lending business because I was a mortgage broker at some point in time. I was a real estate lender at a bank. So I figured, um, you know, why not, why not try to figure out a way to do some bridge loans, right? So then as I have this idea in my head, which I was sort of formulating, how would I find bridge business? A friend of mine who's a broker calls me up and goes, hey, I got a bridge loan. Do you want to look at it? I said, sure. You know, it was like the luckiest thing. And we did that loan. Then we did another loan and we did another loan, right? So I never got into the lending business as really as a business per se. I got into it as a way to give investors returns on a monthly basis while we're waiting for other things to happen in property that we're buying, right? So fast forward, you know, whatever it is, five years now as my company or six years as my company is sort of, uh, you know, in its, uh, I guess, sixth year or whatever it is exactly. You know, we've done 60 whatever transactions, right? Some of those have been debt, some of those have been equity. I'm sort of agnostic as to being debt or equity, as long as my investors are getting treated right and they're making risk adjust, smart, risk-adjusted returns, I'm very happy, right? So I found that you don't always have to be the operator. Yeah, you know, I guess the operators make more money and take more risk, and that's that's and that's okay too. You know, the promotes are there for them and and that's fine, right? And that's great. But if I want to sit back and sort of like think deals through and see what other people are doing and kind of funnel all that information. Like if I see a hundred deals on a given month, it's too much, but let's say it's a hundred, let's say it's 50 and I can funnel that down to one thing I can get done. It's a lot of work, right? But that one thing will be the one because I get to see all the other things that I don't want to do and the risk that I don't want to take and the risk that I can't tell investors to take. So it helps me crystallize my thoughts and keep me very, very objective as to what to invest in and what not to invest in. Listen, I want to, want to tell you something. Um, I always talk about the difference between the, you know, the sponsor side, which is the operator side, uh, the GP side, call it whatever you want. And then on the other side, the investor side, fund side, LP side, all that stuff. And I always say it's two different expertise. Can you I uh, meaning this one is running the show and has to be a lot more focused. I'm talking about the guy who runs the show, the sponsor, et cetera, the guy who brings the deal. Uh, he, he has to worry about the money, but 
usually those guys tend to not want to do that many times. And that's why they go to those guys who raise capital. Uh, can you talk about a little bit from the side of the fund? Because you need to know, uh, obviously, you have to be a professional. You have to know which asset class you want to go to. You have to know X amount of stuff about the deal. You don't have to know the details like, uh, like the guy who runs the show. But can you talk about that a little bit? Meaning, I've been on the two sides, but I want to hear your take on what is important to you when you approach a deal. We're going to soon dig in into, into the asset classes and the story of how you moved from one to another. But that principle itself, can you talk about that for a second? Sure. So when I look to invest equity with somebody, whether I'm, whether I'm part of the LP or part of the GP, it doesn't really matter. But when I look to invest equity with somebody who's an operator, I look for you know a couple of things, which is almost similar to the borrower side. But, you know, are they taking a lot of leverage to get to their returns? Right. I don't know if they're taking too much leverage is probably not for me. Do they know what they're doing? Are they good people? Which really is the first thing. Right. Are they good people? Right. hundred percent. Do I know them for X amount of years? Does a good friend of mine know them if I don't know them? I, I like to make some common connection because I'm very sponsor driven. And the sponsors I've invested with, all people I know for quite a long time, or I got to know through somebody else, which is very, very critical for me. I have to know that though that person in charge is treating their investors right and will treat my investors right. And that's very, 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 very critical to me. I love that. And I have the same approach, which, which is very awesome. critical. And not everyone, not, not everybody has that, by the way. Not everybody has that. I, I have to have that because I'm responsible for people's money and I have to make sure it works. Now, there are always challenges and bumps along the road and not everything is perfect, but the person has to have impeccable integrity and that's that, right? So that takes care of that. Right. Then, you know, are they too leveraged? Are they taking a little bit of leverage? Are they experienced in the asset class? Can they figure it out? Do they know what they're doing? And that's also part of it. And yes, and sometimes we all make mistakes and this guy didn't figure that out right. We made, we made a mistake on this and it happens, right? But certainly from an equity investor, I need to know that people are treating all investors right. And that's super important, right? And once I get over that hurdle, which if I know the person for 10 or 15 or 20 years, it's not really a hurdle, right? But uh, once you get over that hurdle, it's the business plan and what the smarts behind the plan is, right? On the on the debt side, I'm also very sponsor driven. Sometimes I know all my borrowers, which is great. Sometimes they have great business plans, which is great. So if a guy, you know, like I gave a guy once a million and a half dollars on an eight million dollar piece of property, he had no real business plan, right? Because he had to just refinance the property, had to pay off from some debts, whatever. I didn't care because I was a million five on eight million, right? Or seven million. So I'm a very low levered loan. I didn't have to care so much about his business plan. His business plan was to clean up his debt and pay me off in a year. And he did it. He actually came through, which was amazing. Great for him, right? But if I'm doing a deal where a guy has a value add and there's a lift or heavy lift or a light lift, they have to know what they're doing too, right? So I don't want to be in a construction loan or a renovation loan or anything that requires heavy lifting where the sponsor may not be able to execute and he may want high leverage as well, right? So, it, and, and a lot of guys are lending money at all sorts of leverage points. Maybe the sponsor's qualified, maybe they're not. I'm, I don't know, because I don't see every loan, obviously. But for me specifically, it has to be either a low levered value add play, a low levered liquidity need loan, or, a, or my basis is so great and that property is so great, I love it or the sponsor has to have a real plan to take me out, right? And, and that's, that, that's really important because I don't want to be in court with anybody. I just want to make a loan, I just want to get paid back, right? That's what I want to do. And um, basically that's been working for us. That, that, that's slower approach, picking off deals here and there. It's basically been working overall. That's very good. Tell me something, um, which was the first asset class you went for and what was the first thing you heard that got you to move between asset classes? Because many people to say, you know what, I'm focused on this thing. That's right. what I like to do. This is my thing. I don't want to move. And by the way, just I always say that, that when you talk to a, a multifamily guy, he would, and I'm not talking about COVID time, pre-COVID, he would badmouth the retail market. You talk right. to a retail guy, he would badmouth the hotels and multifamily and, and that way. So everyone who moves, and I'm one of those, but I'm saying everyone who moves between asset classes has an approach. What is yours and 
what made you move from one thing to another? So when I started the company, I decided I wanted to be in multifamily space and only in Brooklyn. That was it, right? Multifamily Brooklyn and only Northern Brooklyn, right? Bushwick, Ben Stuy, Park Slope. It was very hyper focused. I, I literally drove every block of Bushwick, Ben Stuy, Park Slope, Clinton Hill, Greenpoint, North, South, East, West to get to know the neighborhoods, right? I decided that was where I wanted to be because, you know, everyone's got to live somewhere. Right? And they're good neighborhoods, right? They're good neighborhoods. Then I decided there were quiet property, you know, quiet places in Brooklyn, like you know, uh, Sheepshead Bay, you know, Brighton Beach, Gravesend, that aren't necessarily as exciting on the radar, but they're just good, solid real estate, right? So I wanted to be in multifamily because I, you know, people need a place to live. It's a good business model, generally speaking, conservative, um, and that's exclusively what we did for a while was Brooklyn acquisitions and brooklyn loves great it sounds then, like a a and b class pretty straightforward super straightforward right super straightforward um then after a couple of years the market got too hot and, and then, we, then we ended up buying some things in the bronx and we ended up buying something you know in, in the city which is fine great but things got too hot after a while right and i realized i don't want to chase four caps and three caps and two caps i'm just not doing it it's just not for me it doesn't work for me and i don't want to be too much in development even though i've, I've invested with very experienced ground up developers and they do a great job and I, you know i don't want to be too much in that either because it just takes too long from start to finish to get paid for investors and it's just you know, i don't want to do that right too much right so i said you know what i gotta find something to do outside of the country and outside of new york so we found a property by New Jersey with a friend of mine. We bought it. We found another property in New Jersey. We bought it. Multifamily. We found two small properties in Florida. We bought them. And then, and then a friend of mine introduces me to a sponsor, a New York based um, family that was buying a pretty nice sized deal in Atlanta. And I went in with them. You know, they were of, I met them through a friend of a friend, but they were of impeccable quality, impeccable character impeccable operators class a all the way his money you know so that and that's working out thankfully nicely so on the equity side i had to move out because i couldn't chase these deals anymore i couldn't tell investors yeah let's buy a two cap it's a great deal right it just and it might have been a great deal but i don't know and then when the red stabilized laws came that's okay with that in june 2019 not to get political but that killed the business right that was the end of that right and i don't want to get too deep into that so, and then on the debt side, it was almost similar. So we did a lot of loans in Brooklyn. I had a chance to do a loan in New Jersey, took the opportunity, I did it. Fast forward to last year, I had a chance to do, and I did other loans in Brooklyn, even after the rent stabilized laws, that's okay. Fast forward to last year, we, we funded a defaulted note pool down south in, in the, the, the collaterals in uh, Indiana, Tennessee, Texas, Florida, St. Louis. So. A friend of mine was buying pool loans. He's a great sponsor. He knows what he's doing. Great guy, good quality, good character, the whole nine yards. We, we did that loan. I was able to do something in California. We did that loan with somebody who's good quality, good character, impeccable person, right? So it just adds up for me. So were those loans, sorry that I'm interrupting. Yeah, no worry. Those loans in, in Tennessee and all those places um, were hard money or were you know, first, first positions, man, right. what was no, that? we, we, the, the sponsor, my friend, the borrower bought a pool of loans, defaulted mortgages. I got it. Defaulted. We financed the acquisition of that pool and we put equity in the deal as well. That is so 180 cool. some odd different assets. That, that was, which year was that? We closed that in, uh, it feels like a thousand years ago, but we closed that in November, 2020, right? November, 2020. Wow. Was that, took a while. was that COVID related? Huh? Was that COVID related? Or was that, was that pre COVID? Pre COVID? Yeah. Pre -COVID. No, no. It, was, it wasn't a COVID deal, not a COVID deal. The lender just had a bunch of loans on his books he wanted to get rid of. And my friend spotted a smart opportunity. He no, said, it was after COVID, yeah. And we went in, we did it. And we put, it, we put the deal together with investors in the family office. We put the deal together. Awesome. And if you asked me two, three years ago, and I would have put together a note on note loan. For a defaulted note pool down south, I'd probably say no. And if you asked me two, three years ago if I would have done a loan in California, I probably would have said no. So I've learned how to expand. And we're doing a loan in Florida now. Hopefully, we'll close in a couple of weeks. You know. So. What was the switch that that 
made you say, okay, I can go further? There's too much, two things. There's too much hot money chasing New York. And then New York died with 29, with, with the rent stabilized laws. And, and, there's too, and there's a lot of capital chasing low levered loans in New York. Sometimes you don't have all the low lever, the low, uh, the low cost of capital funds. And just realize it's a big country. You know, it is a big country. So why not pick, you know, places around the country and deals that make sense to get into? Because you have to pay bills, right? If you don't do deals, you don't pay bills. But you have to do smart deals, right? And, you know, and, and recently, it's funny enough, I was talking to somebody I know. I'm, I'm a loan participant in a, in, a, in a loan with somebody. And they run like a several billion dollar fund, right? And the guy called me a sniper. He said, I'm the sniper of real estate. I said, what do you mean? He goes, you sit in your small office, you know, and uh, you pick off deals here and there and you make money for people. I go, yeah, I guess I am a sniper. But it was like a compliment from a guy that runs a couple of billion dollars, right? But but by doing that, by focusing and only and saying no to a lot of different deals for any reason or no reason, it really focuses my attention on what I really think is worthwhile doing, not just you know, let's do it to do it because we'll get a fee. So let's do it to do it because it's really good. And that's the idea behind our business. And those deals come to you from friends already or you have a set of brokers that uh, you work with? M most business we originate, most comes from people I already know, not brokers. I speak to a lot of brokers. I love a lot of them. Some have become really close friends. Um, but most deals we do have come from people that I know. So, okay, so tell me something. You, and all these deals that we're speaking about, whether they are equity or loan or whatever they are, they're all, I'm assuming, multifamily you spoke about, or these are different types? Not, of not, not all multi, nope. Uh, so, On the so acquisition what? side, it's mostly been multi. Now we're doing um, uh, medical office space. We're buying some medical Let's office. Let's talk about that a little bit. What, what got you excited about that space? So it's, it's quite apparent to me that, you know, Amazon can't take over the medical business, right? And, and telemedicine can only take you so far, right? So I did three telemedicines during COVID. Each one resulted in a visit to the doctor's office or a lab or something, right? So, if, you know, if, you, if, if your back hurts, you need the x-ray. If you broke your foot, you need the doctor. Right. If you need a spot, you got to go in. If your kid right. needs something, you got to take your kid, you know? That's just the way it is, right? So, and then a friend of mine comes to me and goes, look, you know, we're looking at buying product in the medical space. I go, really, I'm in, you know, because I, I like the space. Again, I'm not really an operator and I'm an investor for my group. I go, I like the space a lot. Let me know. So we spoke about it for a few months and voila, we're here for our first, you know, acquisition. We're gonna invest money in the LP with them. Good sponsors, good reputations, great people, you know, it's impeccable. So it's, it's, it's so, the asset class, can't, I, I don't think, can disappear, right? You know, it has to, you can't just Amazon it away, right? So it's stable. More resilient. It's resilient. It's cash flowing. There's some upside. There's good financing on it long term. There's decent cap rates on it. Certain places, certain places. Um, so I said, you know what? Let's do it. So well, it didn't take me too long to say, let's do it. Because I already knew I liked the space. I've always liked the space. Every time I had to go to a doctor, wait for 45 minutes, you know, you, or something, you'd say, wow, this is a great business, right? So, uh, and, 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 and if you buy, and the way we're buying them is sort of interesting. I don't want to get too deep into it, but I, um, I just want to expand. Like everyone's in industrial and everything's a four cap and everyone loves multifamily. It seems like everything's a four cap or a five cap every time I turn around with no upside. So you have to create the value and create the upside or at least generate a cash return so investors will be happy. So that, that's sort of my thinking. It's good thinking. Tell me something. You spoke about industrial, right? And you got into industrial. When did you get into industrial? No, so we, we made one loan in the industrial space. I'm not in industrial. I would like to be more. We made one loan on a small industrial piece last, uh, about a year and a half ago, maybe in Queens. Yeah. And it was a simple liquidity loan. The guy, you know, had a $4 million, call it industrial warehouse is what it was. And he needed half a million bucks as a hit, take it. You know, like it's like, it was like an easy loan to make. You know, no, no thinking involved really, you know. So it was in Queens, you know, 20 minutes from my office. I drove there. So I, okay, here's the loan, you know. So it was fairly, uh, fairly straightforward. You know, a friend of mine is in that industrial space, you know, acquiring properties, um, pretty smart at it. He's been doing it for a while. He's pretty smart at it. 
Um, we have an investor get together because he has his own set of investors. He seems to have all the money in the world, so it's good. But if he came to me and said, hey, we're doing a deal. Do you want to be, you know, half the equity or this or that or whatever, you know, I, I would I would consider it because I know I know he knows what he's doing. I know he's a good person. I know his family is invested. I know I know they care about their investors. So it's the same theme over and over and over and over again. Right. And that's the way to go. Um, let me ask you this. You do a lot of debt, a lot of debt financing. Did you have a default? And if you could tell us a little bit about experience that either where defaults, what did you do with it? How did you, you know, react to it yep. emotionally and business-wise? And also uh, if you've managed to uh, resolve it, meaning that it didn't come to that point. Correct. So we've had a few defaults, thankfully. Not, not a lot, thankfully. We've had a few. Um, one default was a guy was refining and it took him a few extra months and he didn't want to pay current. So he ended up paying us, you know, 24% for those three months, four months it took him. I said, you don't want to pay, you're paying us 10. He goes, no, I'll just pay on the way out. So it was like a friendly way of getting there together. He just didn't want to. We knew he was refinancing. Um, we had the broker, we spoke to them. We knew it was just taking a long time, whatever the reason was, uh, uh, but we got paid off, right? We got paid off, good. Another default we had with a repeat borrower lasted probably a year and change. Uh, they were fighting, you know, they, they did a lot of, they did a lot with us. They had some personal issues together, they ended up splitting up. Um, but that lasted quite a while, about a year, year and change. And I wanted to keep it friendly because we did a lot of business, we became friendly and I wanted to make sure that we could stay friendly. And I kept that loan with my investor we kept that loan, figuring we would get paid off at some point, and it worked out. We got paid. We didn't collect the fourth interest. We didn't. Um, we didn't lose any money, um, but we got paid off. But it took about um, somewhat over a year for them to resolve their internal issue for us to get paid. So not the end of the world, right? We had another default during COVID last year, where a borrower said to me, "I'm not paying you." My lawyer said, "I'm going to pay you." It's COVID. I don't have to extend the loan. I uh, had a refund. What, what was that? Was that a multifamily or medical? Uh, not a multifamily property. It was a luxury home, we'll call it, right? Um, I don't have to extend the loan. You, 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 you know, I don't have to. I don't have to. I say, look, you know what? Here's what we'll do. Pay us nothing for the month. Let's see what happens next month. Okay. Pay us half. I don't want to pay you anything. Okay, good. So we had to send a nasty letter, a nice but nasty letter, right? After a couple of months saying, hey, look, you're in default. And, um, you know, please pay. And that's simple. All I have to, you know, pursue remedies. Now, I don't want to be in court with anybody. So I called a couple of debt funds or people I know, hey, do you want to buy this loan if I want to sell it? They all wanted to buy the loan except for one of them. So I knew I had an exit strategy with that loan. And I was ready to sell it. And my partner said, I don't know, sell it, don't sell it. It's a good loan. It is. A good, it's a very good loan, very good collateral. But I, the borrower woke up and his lawyer, I guess, spoke to him and said, you got to pay these guys. And... Uh, he made us current and he's been current since, right? He's been current since, right? So, so which is good, which is good because I, I, I want to avoid fighting and arguing at all costs, right? It's just never, never leads to anything in my mind anyway, right? So, so we had that. Um, those thankfully all resolved themselves, which is good. Uh, we have another loan that's in default now. We're working with the borrower, we're working with his bank work together, pursuing a way to figure out together how to get to the exit. And um, he's a good guy, good borrower, had a problem, not avoiding anything. A uh, little slow moving sometimes, but it's okay. Sometimes things are slow, but we're, we're, we're working together, figuring out what to do, right? What to do. And it's working out. It's working out. I think we'll be okay. Um, we're accruing, but I think we'll be okay. So thankfully, very thankfully, I haven't had a lot of defaults that have um, been problematic, right? Um, that's because we don't do 100 loans a month, right? So if, you get, if you're doing 50, 100 loans a month, you're getting sloppy, you're gonna have a lot of defaults, right? If you're lending to people continuously that don't have a plan or don't have you know, a, a good piece of collateral that people want, they just, or you're just making loans to make them and get fees, then you have a lot of defaults and I don't want to deal with a lot of defaults. This is why we don't do a lot of loans. I want to really, really pick my spots carefully and make sure my investors are paid appropriately. If we have a default, we can navigate through that default. Tell me something, how is it working with investors? 
I love my investors. They all know that. No, I, I do love my investors. I, uh, I've been very fortunate to accumulate a good group of guys, some of whom I know 30 years or 40 years for that matter. Some I know 20 years. Some are friends of friends that I know 20 years. So I've been very fortunate to put together a great group of people and, and meet other family offices I can invest with or the debt funds I can invest with. It's been really a blessing for my business to know a lot of quality people. So investors, you have to understand the temperament of your investors, right? If you have a group of conservative conservative investors that you've cultivated, you can't give them, you know, we're going to buy this development site with 90% leverage and make three times our money. You can't do that to people and convince them it's not risky, right? So you have to sort of give investors what makes them comfortable, right? Now, some investors have a high risk tolerance, I guess, but no investor ever said to me, here's millions of dollars, go to town, take all the risk you want and report back to me. Like no one's ever said that to me, right? Because I, I guess I've cultivated a group of people who just want their money back. And sometimes we have trouble with equity. It happens periodically, not too often, thankfully. But you have to, you know, treat your investors like it's your money. You can't treat them like cash registers. You have to treat your investors like business partners, which is what they are. They're partners in your success and your partner in their success. So, and not every investor understands how hard it is to put deals together. Some investors think it's easy, something that you, know, you walk in, you find the deal, you do it, and I don't want to do this deal because it, it looks too good. Okay, or I don't want to do this deal because it looks too bad. But some investors spend the time to critically think through things, and their feedback is great. And some investors just send me money because they send me money. They're, I'm not sure they read, they should be reading everything, but I'm not sure they do read everything because they're busy running their own businesses, right? But some of my investors will read everything and make their own decisions, which is fine. And that, that is fine. I, I want my investors to be super comfortable putting money with me. Because if you do one thing, that one thing may not work out properly. If you do 10, okay, so one may not work out properly. Two will be better you know, than we expect. And the rest will just go according to plan, hopefully with some bumps along the way, right? So you know, investors are great, love them all. They're great to me. Many of them are really good friends and become really good friends over time. Um, but you have to understand their psyche behind their lives and what motivates them to put money to work. And if you can work around those parameters, like, like the thing I don't like when people call me sometimes, like when a borrower starts to sell me very hard or a broker tries to sell me very hard, I, I turn the light switch off and I'm done. I don't want to be sold. So similarly, when an investor says to me, you know, I'm not so comfortable with this. I don't want to do it. I say, okay, no problem. I'll call you next time. Like I, I don't sell them. I want them if you're not comfortable, I may ask, what's your thinking, your reasoning? Oh, that's a good reason. But I don't go back and say, here's what you're missing. Do this, do that. So when I get sold from somebody, I turn it off. So I don't want to, I don't want to sell anybody on anything. If I want to sell something, I would sell Ferraris and Lamborghinis, right? But I don't, I don't want to right. sell anything. We're in the investment business, and I'm here to give people the skill, you know, decisions. They can make critical decisions, give them information. Be very blunt. And in fact, somebody once told me I'm a terrible salesman. And I said, thank you very much. You know, that's great. I appreciate the compliment. I'm not here to be a salesman. Why don't you sell me? You're not selling me hard enough. He told me, an investor told me that. I said, I'm not here to sell you anything. I'm here to give you, you know, make some decisions about your money, right? So he never invested with me though. So that's the funny part is the guy, the guy who wanted me, he wanted me to sell him so hard to invest. I, I wouldn't do it because it's just not my thing, right? So, um, you just got to understand your investors. If you remember, there was that movie, I forgot the name of it, Glenn something with, uh, um, I forgot the name of the actor. I'm so bad at that. Uh, you know, the ABC always be closing, always be closing. You remember that? Oh, one? with the, uh, with the tin, with the tins, with the salesman, the tin salesman, right? They yeah, sold, exactly. that's a great movie. Alec Baldwin, that was Alec Baldwin. Yeah, right? Baldwin. yeah, yeah. So, that's a so, great movie. So, right? Always be closing, right? Always be closing. <laughs> So I heard from someone something very interesting. Forgot the name of the guy. It doesn't come up to mind, but something I read it in his book and I heard it from him. Forgot the name because credit is due when he's got. Oh, Hunter Thompson. You're too young to forget things. Stop Hunter, forgetting. Hunter Thompson. I'm close to your age, closer than you think. Hunter Thompson, his name. Very smart guy. And he said, ABD, always be disclosing when it comes disclosing. to investments. And that's, I agree with that 100%. When it comes to investors, you have to just give him all, give him it all, you know, all of it. And if it fits them, uh, they'll come in. And if it doesn't, uh, it doesn't they better not come in. 
if it does, like, like yesterday, I told the borrower, here's why I don't want to do the deal. He sends me an email, uh, sends you another email, sends you another email. I was like, oh, I'm done. <laughs> I'm not responding again. Right. Like, it's not for me. Like, move on. If it's so good, somebody else will do it. You know, like, right. I don't want not to only so maybe it doesn't, it's not a good fit for one person or for one group. Maybe it's a good fit for another group. Well, that's the way it is. For me. It's life. What am I supposed to do? You know, so um, that's, the way it is. that's the way it is. Exactly. Tell me something. Um, as a guy who has been uh, doing different type of things, equity, debt, different asset classes, different areas, um, let's talk about the market today, okay? We had COVID going on, and um, and you went through this, and now we're emerging, as we call it, we're trying to get out of it. You know, the vaccine is coming in, but a lot of people are talking about all the forbearance, PPP loans that happen, the forbearance, the, you know, uh, you know, everything that went through in terms of the debt, and you are right in it, you know, uh, the payments did not come in, um, whatever came in and didn't come in, um, is, is there going to be a foreclosure, is there going to be a lot of foreclosures coming in or not, uh, in which asset classes, what is happening in New York, because you are in New York, and, uh, and what is happening in those cities where you got in, you know, in the Atlantas and Tennessees, et cetera, et cetera, and Texas and so on. What is your take on that one? Where's the market is going? What are you looking at? What will, what do you think? Nobody has a crystal ball for us, but what do you think will happen in the next year, year and a half? What is the next move you think? Um, should be done? Generally speaking, I have no idea. Right. So, so that's no that, right? Right. So how's that for an honest answer? Right. Like honest anyone, answer. I found over the last six or eight, 12 months, you know, everybody became a COVID-19 expert overnight. You know, you're leasing office space, you're a COVID-19 expert. You're a lender, yeah. you're a COVID-19 expert. You're, you're a whatever. You're, so I have no idea, right? So what I try to do is, let's say, let's take the New York market, for example, right? right. I can only deal with what I know, right? I know there's rent-stabilized laws. That's, that's hurt the rent-stabilized business. Yeah, that's a pre-COVID thing that we know about. That's a that was the thing, thing everybody but, spoke about before COVID. But, right, but it's still important, right? I know yes. there's COVID, and I personally believe has been handled properly by our mayor, governor, city, doesn't matter. I, my opinion, good for me, good. Um, I don't know how fast New York specifically will come back. I believe in New York, it will come back. But I think the challenge in New York is there are, and again, and I hate to be political, but politics and business are inextricably linked. Inextricably. Absolutely. You know, if you're too too high in your taxes, too much regulation, too much anti-this, you can't do business, right? So, so the way I look to do business now in New York is simple. If somebody needs a loan on a property in New York, for whatever the reason is, it's like I'm doing a loan now, the guy paid three million for a building, you know, I guess it's worth, Roughly that, maybe a little less, two and a half million, let's say. Okay. He needs a million five. I'm happy to give it to him because the, it's a condom. So, because the last time that that property traded for a million nine was in 2019, or uh, 2009, I'm sorry, 2009. So, if the last time the property traded was a million nine in 2009, I'm at a million five, I've got to go back many years to break even, right? The things have to get so bad for me to be at break even, so I can live with that risk, right? I can live with that risk. If if I'm buying, and I'm not, and I'm buying like these medical offices now with somebody, I'm buying it because I don't know what's gonna happen, right? But I do know the stability of the asset class over the last five, six, seven, 10, 20 years, and I do believe that mess is not disappearing. So I think we'll be okay. Like I really do think we'll be okay, right? So that's with New York specifically. When I did a, um, when you know we were looking to buy a property recently in New Jersey, great location, and then long long story short, you know, rent stabilizers are coming to that neighborhood in New Jersey. We're like, oh my god, I, I can't deal with that. I'm out. So once that passes or doesn't pass, we can revisit that location again, right? But so I don't know what's going to be next year, next week. I just try to look at things and I try to see where we are today. Where were we five years ago? Where were we last year? What's the likelihood of this property going down 50% in value. Hmm, okay, I guess I guess it could happen. Or okay, so if I'm a 50% levered loan, I'd be even. Okay. If I'm 75% or 70%, do I want to own it or can I sell it to somebody? Right. So that's part of undercurrent 
where we are today. Right. I think New York will come back. I think, you know, things will be great again one day. I think uh, it comes with, you know, good leadership. The people of New York are great people. Leadership needs to be a little better in my opinion, no one else's opinion, but um, I, I believe in New York. We have in Atlanta, we bought a great property with somebody who's was doing great. Apparently everybody's employed, you know, the, everyone's paying rent. It's amazing. It's great. I mean, during COVID, a little bit, a couple of months was challenging, but lately it's been amazing. You know, it's been amazing. Um, New Jersey properties are doing okay. Um, so I, I don't know the future. I, 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 you know, everyone has opinions because they think they, in their mind, they think it's going to work out perfectly. Right. But I don't know that it will. I hope it will. I hope everything's perfect. And I think it will get better. It will get better. And things are getting better. You know, you're seeing it. Stores are open again. People are taking the train again. People doing business. The office office space in New York is a little challenging. But I was in Florida, uh, Passover time, 12 days. Places hopping and popping. Busy. Yeah, yeah. There it's a different story. I'm Southeast is hopping, popping, busy. You know? A whole People, different ballgame over there. All different world down there. It's amazing. Like, like It's like... Nothing. And people are being careful. And people are wearing masks, but life has to go on, right? So, my crystal ball, like you mentioned earlier, is in the shop. I don't have it, right? But uh, I'm not an expert in anything other than trying to figure out what's the likelihood of something going wrong, because everything always goes right, as we know, right? But uh, I'm trying to figure out the likelihood of things going wrong and what those repercussions would be, and then we make the investment or not make or don't make the investment. Right. We don't know what will happen, but we do our very best to maneuver with what we have at hand. Um, tell me something. Uh, and before we get to the finish line of the show, um, what tip will you give to people, young or older, that want to get into the business? What is the first thing that they have to know or the thing that they have to do in order to get into this business? Uh, become a doctor. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> the first thing is <laughs> So, so, right. so, so, so somebody become a COVID is, expert. Right, become a COVID expert, right? Become, a, become a, uh, a COVID expert, right? What would I tell somebody? I would say you can't start at the top, right? Everybody seems to want to become the head of whatever tomorrow, right? So if you don't know the basics, you just can't do it. End of discussion, right? So, and, and, if you're, and I, I don't think I'm that smart. I just work pretty hard, right? And a lot of things I've learned, I've learned from watching other smart people operate, in which I'm blessed because I, I know a lot of smart people, right? So, I, you know, I, I work pretty hard. I listen. I pay attention to well, in business. My wife says maybe otherwise, but, you know, I pay attention. And you have to just know what you're talking about. And sometimes it's okay to say, you know what? I'm not sure. Let me find out, right? But the very bottom, you got to know what you're talking about to some degree. To a lot of degree, you can't just say, uh, you know, well, it's a great property because he's a great guy. That doesn't work. That doesn't work, you know. You have to just know the facts. Know that you may not have to know the minutia behind every zoning law on the planet, but you kind of have to know what it's zoned for, right? You kind of have to know what can be done there. You kind of have to know the relative values of the neighborhood. You kind of have to know the. Like, you have to know, for lack of, if not, and no pun intended, you need a foundation, right? You need a foundation of knowledge to build on, right? And you really do. And if you, it doesn't matter if you're 25, 45, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. It just takes a little bit of learning curve, right? And that's the way it works in life, a little bit of learning curve. So I would just say, learn everything you can, which kind of helps you build some, you don't, you don't need to be the perfect expert in everything because you can be, but you need to know enough to get by to make those decisions or to have a coherent conversation with an investor or with a, if you're a broker, let's say with a potential buyer or seller, you want to get a listing, you have to explain to them why they should do it with you. And I'm, again, I'm not very heavy on the selling, so I'm more heavy on the, uh, on the facts behind things, but my personal opinion is less on the salesmanship or saleswomanship even, and more on the, on the knowledge and the facts and the cold hard, here is what it is, boom. And I, to me, that's very important. That's, that was critical. You know something I always say to people, um, it's all about the team, right? It's all about the team. And, and obviously, when you're talking about a fund uh, structure or, you know, raising capital structure, whether it's debt or equity or whatever, you have certain type of uh, team, whether small or large, uh, that you have to work with. Who is, you don't have to say who, but what type of a team you are relying on? Who, who is your go-to? Because there's a part of what you said, 
you really don't have to know anything. And we both know that. You don't have to know anything, but you have to know who to go to. So what is your, who is your who that is your first rank, second rank, or both or whatever? What is your, what's, what's the rule? How do you work? When it comes to those things, I basically rely on my granddaughter to tell me what to do. <laughs> they're, they're smart. Those girls, those girls are brilliant. You know, no, I have I need something. I go to them. They say, "Grandpa, no." I um, right. So I'm a single operator in my office. I've been again blessed with knowing many, many people. Um, if I have a construction loan that I think is really good, I go to my friend who's a developer who's a construction lender. Say, "Hey, what do you think about this?" I love. Oh, good. Let you want to do it? Let's do it. He takes over, I, I do that. If I have a zoning question, I can go to an architect that I know and I've gotten to trust over time, right? If I have a legal question, I go to, I go to, the, I go to the lawyer who I use and know and trust over time. If I want a gut check on value, call a friend of mine in the business. What do you think about this? You know, so I don't have, uh, my, my team is sort of my network, right? I have myself, I outsource a few things here and there, but. You know, I'm working on a loan now. I'm, I'm going to be a senior mez. I've got the senior lender. I'll be the mez. And hopefully we'll do the loan together. And he's got a little more experience in certain things than I have. And we're saying his due diligence, due diligence we need. Let's review it together. Let's get to the finish, loan, finish line together, right? So I'll use his expertise, his office's expertise to help make sure that our loan, because we're senior mez together, you know, we want to do this properly, that our loan is a good loan, right? So again, it comes to it comes to my network of people that I've developed over many, many years of knowing people and building relationships, um, is what I rely on. If I have a question about how to structure or this or that, call a friend of mine. A, if I have a problem, I call a friend of mine to say, solve my problem, I don't want to deal with it, you're unemotional about it, you figure out what I do with this thing. and they, and they do. And then similarly, people call me. They go, hey, I'm stuck in this. What should I do? They go, here's what you do. You may not like the answer, but here's what you got to do, right? So it works both ways. Right? I do that for people as well. So it's it's good. And, I'm, and again, I am very blessed to have you know, that network that I could I could rely on. Awesome. Network is the, is the key. Um, Elliot, I really thank you for your time. It was really fun. My pleasure. Thank this was great. Thank you. Thank you. It was tons of great tips. And to you guys who are listening and watching or listening or watching, call it whatever you want. Uh, It was great to have you. I'll see you guys in the next show. Take care.